Welcome to the Radical Truth Podcast. I am your host, Glenn Meldrum, and this podcast is brought to you by In His Presence Ministries. Visit us on the web at www.ihpministry.com. I really love the response of the disciples when they were with Jesus in a boat on the Sea of Galilee during a tempest. We looked at this account in our last lesson. Jesus was in the stern of the boat on a cushion, having a well-deserved sleep after a grueling day of ministry. But the disciples were in a major panic, afraid that they were ready to die at any moment in this fierce storm. They were irritated at Jesus because he wasn't in a terrified frenzy like they were, but was having a good snooze, even as the boat was being tossed about and the waves were washing over him. We see their being irritated with Jesus in Mark chapter 4, verse 38, where they said to Jesus, Teacher, don't you care if we drowned? Luke and Matthew recorded something similar, where the disciples finally woke him up and said, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. There were probably many other things the disciples said to Jesus in the terrified state that weren't recorded. Jesus spoke three little words, quiet, be still, or peace be still, as the King James Version rendered it. He didn't have to scream out a command. He could have just willed it, but he spoke it loud enough so the men in the boat could hear. After rebuking the storm, Jesus then rebuked the disciples for their unbelief. The response of the disciples is wonderful and understandable. Dr. Luke recorded that, In fear and amazement they asked one another, Who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. Matthew recorded that the men asked each other, What kind of man is this? That's a really good question. Jesus wasn't done amazing them by any stretch of the imagination, and we will turn our attention to the next amazing thing that Jesus did. This next event is the deliverance of the demoniac, and the story is found in Luke chapter 8, verses 26 to 39. Luke gave us the context of this event in verse 26. They sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. It seems that after Jesus calmed the sea that they went to Gerasenes, which was his desired destination before the storm began. I won't bore you with the theological arguments on the name and location of the city, but there's no contradiction in the gospel accounts as to its location. The event took place near Decapolis, which was a grouping of ten cities. This was a divine setup where Jesus left a thriving season of ministry that was attended by vast crowds to rescue one madman that everyone would have said was utterly hopeless. Verse 27 continues to lay out the setting. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but lived in the tombs. Luke and Matthew record that there was only one demoniac, while Matthew chapter 8 verse 28 states that there were two. My guess is that Luke and Mark only record one demoniac because he was either the more prominent of the two, the only one that walked with God after their deliverance, or was the one that wanted to follow Jesus. Another possibility could be that the one mentioned was the one who joyfully declared what God had done for him, while the other one didn't. Since we aren't told the reason for the differences in the accounts, all we can do is make some educated guesses. The spiritual and moral condition of the man is stated in that he didn't wear any clothes and lived in the tombs, which would have been caves. In verse 29 we read, Many times it had seized him, and though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demon into solitary places. This man at times had a demonically empowered strength to break the chains that bound him. I would also add that the self-abuse he heaped upon himself caused him to care little about the physical pain. His mental and spiritual pain of the demon possession was far worse. The loneliness of hell is expressed in how the demoniac was driven by the demons into a solitary place. It wasn't just that he was separated from God due to his sin and demon possession, but he was also alienated from people. Loneliness is a terrible torment, and to be in hell all alone with memories of the sin and evil people practice would be agonizing. This verse also shows that there were times when the man was a little more sane. God will not violate our free will, and devils can't. People are possessed by demons when they open themselves up to demonic activity through the practice of sin. 
There is a line people cross in their practice of sin that opens the door for demon possession. When a demon gets a firm grip on a life, then he works hard to open the door a little wider so that more devils can enter. Demons can only possess those who open up to them through some horrendous sin or habitual sin. Matthew adds that the man was so violent that no one could pass that way. In Mark chapter 5, verses 3 through 5, we are given a little bit more information about the man. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. In modern culture, demoniacs are given psychotropic drugs so that they can be controlled. Since doctors and caretakers don't have a remedy for demon possession, all they can do is try to manage the devil in them. Only Jesus has a cure to demon possession. Dr. Luke wrote in verse 28, When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, don't torture me. Mark adds that when he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. Every knee will bow and acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. And these demons were forced to do that at that moment. They probably wanted the man to run in the opposite direction, but they were subject to absolute divine authority. Notice that Jesus didn't speak a word, but the demons knew him from a distance and trembled. It's ironic that demons know who Jesus is far better than the religious Jews did. The demons cried out through the man acknowledging that Jesus is divine, that he is the Son of the Most High God. Think of this for a moment. The disciples almost drowned in a sea in a violent storm, and with the word Jesus calmed the storm, and they talked among themselves, what kind of man is this? Now they hear a demoniac declare Christ's divinity. The Lord was planning these events out so that the disciples would continue to grow in the knowledge of the Lord's divinity. The demon screamed out of the man, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, don't torture me. Just like with most people, demons are consumed with themselves. They are full of self to a demonic level. Jesus didn't go into this region to torment some deranged devils, but to set a man free from their torment. These demented devils were fearful of their coming judgment because they didn't want to be bound in hell before their time had come. They view hell as a place of torture or torment, which in one sense it is. Rather than hell being a place where God is forever torturing his enemies, the actual torment comes through the tangible absence of God, which is agony beyond our ability to fathom. In the first sentence of verse 29, we are also told that Jesus had commanded the evil spirit to come out of the man. Jesus commanded the demons to come out, and they had no choice but to obey. They knew who Jesus was and feared him, not with godly fear that's an integral part of loving God. Their fear is the tormenting kind, such as when a burglar knows he's going to get caught and the punishment is sure. Since Jesus has absolute authority, he only needs to speak the command once and it will come to pass. Isn't it strange how rebellious demons know Christ better than we do? They don't know Christ in the relational sense, which only belongs to Christ's followers, but in the intellectual and experiential sense, where they know who God is and what he can do. Every demon knows God's power because they were hurled out of heaven after their terrible rebellion, and they are quarantined to planet earth, waiting for the day they are cast into the lake of fire. Their rebellion against God bred in them a raging hatred for the God that they once loved. Yes, fallen angels are the first backsliders, and those who don't believe in backsliding have a terrible time explaining what happened to the fallen angels and how they got into that condition. What goes on after this isn't an expression of devils fighting against Christ's authority because they can't. Their devilish version of narcissism, which is an inordinate fascination with themselves, caused them to plead that Jesus wouldn't cast them into hell. This is why the demon-possessed are so self-absorbed because it comes from the inspiration of the devils that live inside of them. At this point, the event takes an interesting turn, and this must have shaken the disciples. In verse 30, Jesus asked him, What is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him. 
This was the demon speaking through the man. Since Jesus is God, he has the ability to completely know us. He also knows how to speak to us in ways that we can understand. As in the case with the demoniac, Jesus knew how to communicate with spiritual beings, and they had no choice but to respond. I think Jesus spoke to the demons and the man to teach the disciples how to cast devils out and what they are dealing with. He spoke to the demons and the man and asked their name. Their name was a collective one in that all the demons were identified by that one name. In this way, the demons were unified. Their collective name was Legion because many demons had entered into him. A Roman legion consisted of 12,500 soldiers. Was there literally a legion of demons living in the man? We can't say one way or the other because the exact number isn't given to us beyond their collective name. But we know that there were a lot of devils in him. The evil desire of demons is expressed in verse 31. And they begged him repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. Why did the demons not want to be cast into hell? I think for two major reasons. First, it has to do with their all-consuming narcissism that defines them. They were seeking to save their lives from torment until they are forced into the lake of fire. Secondly, demons have an unquenchable hatred for God. But how do you hurt an all-powerful being? Satan doesn't have the power to remove God from his throne, though he tried and failed. Demons want to hurt God by corrupting those who are made in his image. Before they receive their final judgment, they want to ruin and corrupt as many people as possible. They want to take mankind that was made in the image of God and cause them to reject that phenomenal gift and then be fashioned into the image of devils. This is more horrifying than we can imagine. The idea that the demons begged Jesus repeatedly gives us to understand that there was more to their conversation than what is recorded. This wasn't a time of fellowship between Jesus and those devils. For there is no fellowship between light and darkness. Jesus had an agenda which was to set the man free and to instruct his disciples through this field trip. Once that purpose was accomplished, then the conversation was over and the demons had to leave. In verse 32, the picture grows larger and clearer. A large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into them, and he gave them permission. Pigs are forbidden food under the Mosaic Covenant because they are unclean animals. With all that we know about pigs today, it's easy to understand why they are unclean animals. God knew this and gave this command to protect the people. The presence of a large herd of pigs tells us that the region must have had a substantial Gentile population. Yet they were probably owned by Jewish merchants and swine. This is an express violation of the Mosaic Law. Their destruction, as we will see in the next verse, was the proper manifestation of divine justice for violating his commands. The demons begged Jesus to be allowed to go into the herd of pigs. How fitting. Unclean spirits wanted to go into unclean animals, and here you have a match made in hell. Though the demons begged Jesus to allow them to go into the herd of swine, he didn't allow them to do so out of pity for them, but to further demonstrate his power and authority. Jesus took his disciples on a teaching trip where they could learn a much-needed lesson that would help them advance the kingdom of God after the Lord ascended into heaven. The disciples had been shown Christ's divinity by calming a raging tempest, which proved he was Lord of creation. Now Jesus proved to his disciples that he was Lord over all angelic beings, including devils. These two events proved to the disciples Christ's divinity, yet they were slow to comprehend this. There is one major reason why they had such a hard time grasping this truth. Israel had been severely disciplined time and again over their persistent idolatry. It was severe discipline that eventually cured them of their outward form of idolatry where they worshipped graven images. The command in Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4 became foundational to the Jewish faith at that time. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This clearly teaches that there is only one God. Then further down in that chapter, they were commanded, Do not follow other gods, the gods of the people around you. For the Lord your God who is among you is a jealous God, and his anger will burn against you, and he will destroy you from the face of the land. This truth was instilled in the people and made it difficult for them to think that God would become human and walk among them in humility. 
Before the eyes of his disciples, Jesus gave the demons permission to go into the herd of swine, and those men saw proof of Christ's power and authority over the spiritual realm. Verse 33 presents the evidence. When the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. The man who was demon-possessed had gone mad through the torment those demons inflicted upon him. Now we see this same thing in a herd of swine that went mad and ran off a cliff in an effort to free themselves from the torment of these devils. I don't think the demons wanted the swine to kill themselves, since they begged Jesus to inhabit their bodies. Their possessing the pigs produced in them the only response those animals could have to such vicious tormentors. Some have said that Jesus was wrong to destroy personal property, referring to the pigs, but such arguments don't hold much water. All of creation belongs to God, and what people own is only on loan to them by God. Besides, this was a judgment on the owners that bred and profited from animals that the Lord declared was unclean for the people of Israel. Then you have the fact that Jesus didn't drive those swine off the cliff. This was the demons doing. Since there's only one cliff in that area, it's easy to determine where the event took place. Here was a miracle that many didn't understand, beginning with the swine herders. Verse 34 relates to this point. When those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and countryside. When Jesus healed the sick, they would tell others what he had done for them with a joyful heart. But this miracle of deliverance of the demoniac produced the opposite effect. The swine herdsmen had no swine left to tend. Their occupation was instantly taken from them. If they were Jews, which they probably were, they were doing work that was strictly forbidden by God, and it was right for their occupation to be taken from them. On top of that, they would have been afraid of becoming liable for the loss of those pigs, and forced to reimburse the owners if it was deemed their fault. To their minds, the only way out of becoming liable for the loss of the swine was to cast upon Jesus the blame for the pigs going mad and rushing off the cliff. If the loss of the swine wasn't their fault, then they wouldn't be liable for the loss. The swineherders immediately began telling their story from a negative standpoint to protect themselves. They certainly didn't care what would happen to Jesus and those who were with him once the people found out what had happened. In their selfishness, they were seeking to save themselves, and selfish people really don't care about others. In verse 35, we see the response of the people when they went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. This is just a guess, but it seems that Jesus stayed with the former demoniac to teach him how to live free and to give some time for the people of that region to investigate what had happened. If this was the case, then Jesus was being very kind to the swine herdsmen so that they wouldn't be sold into slavery to pay for the debt of the lost pigs, which would have been a very large amount of money. I think also that Jesus waited for the people to come out so that the testimony of the man that was set free from a legion of demons could be known and the story spread throughout the area. Jesus didn't fear any repercussions and was even willing for the wrath to fall upon him instead of the former demoniac or even the swine herders. The way this verse is worded makes it appear that the people first went to see the swine that were dead upon the rocks at the foot of the cliff. Then they went to see Jesus and found the demoniac clothed and in his right mind. All the people of that area knew of the madman that dwelt among the tombs and were afraid of him. His wild wailing and cutting himself only added to their fear of him. Now he was sitting at Jesus' feet and in his right mind. The people saw the evidence that Jesus has power beyond anything they understood, and they were afraid of him as a result. Yet we see here a beautiful picture. Jesus was sitting there teaching this former demoniac, who was sitting at the Savior's feet clothed and in his right mind. What wonderful acceptance by God. The place of sitting at the feet of Jesus is reserved to those who experience divine deliverance from sin and devils, and humbly bow to his rule over their life. All the supposed great men and women of the world will never experience this privilege because they are so full of self and sin that they will miss out on this blessed place of rest. Mankind, through giving over to sin, have become like madmen that think crazy and do insane things as a result. Since we are all mad when left to ourselves, we think this is normal. 
Yet we easily fail to realize how insane we really are. When we come across those whom Jesus delivered and have come to their right minds, we then think that they are the ones who are insane. When insane people, which is all of humanity, see sane people, which are true followers of Jesus, they are either going to hate them for their sanity or cry out to Jesus to be delivered and made sane themselves. Verse 36 presents an interesting twist of the story. Those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. When the people from that region went out to see what had happened, those who were eyewitnesses of what took place told their story. This appears more to be like a trial rather than an honest investigation to know what happened. In an effort to defend themselves, it seems like the swine tenders were the prosecutors. They were out to prove their innocence and heap upon Jesus all the guilt they could. Yet the whole time it appears that Jesus never defended himself. They ranted and raved on, possibly with many threats, but they were helpless before the meek and lowly Jesus and the evidence of a man delivered from demons. Not just that, they were afraid of Jesus and didn't know what he might do to them, what silly, superstitious people they were. They didn't know Jesus, so they didn't know his love and compassion that was for them. The evidence was easy to be seen and understood. There was a former demoniac sitting clothed and in his right mind, and over the cliff was a pile of dead swine. It was obvious that the demons left the man and went into the pigs who were driven mad and ran off the cliff. The question is, what will we do with Jesus? And there are only two options. Either they will bow before him as the promised Messiah, or they will drive him away, not wanting his intervention into their lives. We see their sad response in verse 37. Then all the people of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave, because they were overcome with fear. So he got in the boat and left. After Jesus calmed the storm on the Sea of Galilee, the disciples asked themselves, What kind of man is he? In their own way, the people of Gerasenes were asking a similar question. The disciples chose to continue to follow Jesus, though they were overcome by what they saw on the sea. In contrast, the people from that region chose to reject Jesus and drive him from their land. All of humanity will fall into one of these two categories. Jesus got into the boat and left because he will not stay with those who don't want him, but will abide with those who do. This is a very important biblical principle. Jesus comes to those who want him and rejects those who don't. Does that seem harsh to you? Yet Jesus honors the choice people make concerning him. He won't force himself upon those who don't want him, and will freely come to those who do. A quick biblical search of the simple phrase, with all your heart, turns up 23 verses that relate to our seeking and loving God with all of our heart. Within that list, we find the well-known verse from Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. This has always been and will always be a criterion for being found by Christ and knowing him to any great degree. He is a great king and deserves nothing less than our wholehearted, undistracted devotion. We see from this that Jesus went where he was wanted. This is probably why he made Capernaum his home base, because there were many from that city that became disciples. Those times that Jesus went into hostile territory where he wasn't wanted and even hated, he did so because there was a lost sheep that he was seeking. Such is the case with the conversion of the sinner woman in Luke chapter 7, where Jesus went into the home of a Pharisee that hated him. A treasure out of darkness was waiting to be mined from that hostile territory, and Jesus thought that this sinner woman was worth the effort to rescue. This is the same for the account that we have been looking at with the deliverance of the demoniac. Jesus thought this demon-possessed man was worth rescuing, that when the man was set free, he would become a follower of Messiah, which he did. And Jesus thought that a young man struggling on drugs was worth rescuing. So he broke into my world, set me free, and then adopted me as one of his sons. What a good and loving Savior we serve. He deserves the reward of his suffering, which is our wholehearted devotion. Now we come to the end of this historical account and read in verses 38 and 39. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. I understand the response of the former demoniac in wanting to follow Jesus. 
The change in his life was radical. He was a man that was full of demons, that abused himself, and who knows what other evil that he had done. But now he's loving Jesus. What a radical transformation. That's all it took. Just a little bit of time, and the man came to understand how easy it is to love Jesus. We have a hard time loving Jesus when we fail to know him as he has revealed himself to us in the Word of God. The biblical Jesus is easy to love, though we do have to continue to cultivate that love for him. It's the unbiblical Jesus that's hard to love because he's a fantasy, a man-made deity of our own making that looks like us rather than the God of Scripture. The real Jesus left all the ministry he was doing on the other side of the sea to go to the shore at that exact moment that the demoniac was in the area. His purpose was simple, set the demoniac free and then adopt him as a son of the faith. That's astounding. If the man didn't want to be with Jesus, then his salvation wasn't real or didn't go very deep like in the parable of the sower. If we don't have a love for Jesus that craves his nearness, then either we don't really know him or we have chosen to follow from a distance. Jesus sent the man away, not because he didn't want the man to be with him, but the Lord had a mission for him to do. What was the man's mission? Return home and tell how much God has done for you. That man didn't have time to go to seminary. His mission began immediately because there were souls at stake. And Jesus knew the man didn't need a seminary degree because he had something far better, which was a powerful testimony of God's great deliverance and acceptance. The passion the former demoniac had would do more than a formal degree that has ruined many a man for ministry. I'm not against getting a degree. I have a master's degree in theology, church history, and philosophy. But education doesn't make a calling. It doesn't make a man or woman of God. With a terrible compromise that's in most Bible schools and seminaries today, I would say that most people are better off not getting a degree. They would be further ahead to grab their Bible and some good commentaries and immerse themselves in God's Word. Then go to the highways and hedges and seek for the lost who might be like the sinner woman or the demoniac that deep inside are aching for deliverance in God's salvation. We are told that the man obeyed. So the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. Delivered and saved one day, and the next day testifying to the saving power of Jesus. That's biblical Christianity. This is what we need today. People that are filled with such gratitude for their salvation that they can't be silent. They must tell others what great things the Lord has done for them. Mark's account adds a little bit more to the story. Jesus said, Go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. Jesus tells the man to go home to his family and begin telling them what great things the Lord had done and how he had mercy on him. I don't doubt the man went home and told his family, but he also told everyone that he was able to reach out to, anybody that would listen. His gratitude and excitement were so great that he began sharing his testimony in Decapolis, his hometown. This grouping of ten cities had a lot of people, and when Jesus came to minister in that vicinity, the work of the former demoniac prepared the way for Jesus to minister there, and revival broke out. We would do well to follow the example of this former demoniac. Thank you for listening to The Radical Truth with your host, Glenn Meldrum. We at In His Presence Ministries pray that this weekly podcast will be a blessing to you. Please tell others about it and subscribe yourself to this free podcast. Don't forget to visit our website at www.ihpministry.com. See you again next time. And may God richly bless you as you seek Him in spirit and in truth. And thirst no more. So come wash in the river. Come drink your fill. Let healing walk.